So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Chandra Mauli, Chandra, um, and I lead the work on adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights in WHO. I'm originally from India, though I've lived and worked outside India for 30 years now, including uh, 10 years in Zambia, in Southern Africa. I'm going to make this presentation with um, Elsie Aquara. Elsie, are you online? Can you say hi? Perhaps Elsie will join us. Elsie is from Kenya. Um, and um, she, will, she does the data work uh, in our team, and she will present um, slides that relate to data. Okay, she's just joining in. Okay, before we get going, uh, the subject of this presentation, of this session is uh, progress in adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. 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 And you can see the slides clearly? Yes. Yes. Okay. So Elsie, I see that you've just joined and feel free to, you want to say a word of introduction, Elsie? Before I get going, hi everyone. My name is Elsie Aquara. I work with Chandra. I've been working over the past um, three years with Chandra on sexual and reproductive health, mostly focusing on the epidemiology section. Happy to join this meeting. Thank you, Elsie, for making the time. So, you know, uh, we do a lot of work with young professionals like Elsie, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to do some work with some of you. Um, WHO is a wonderful place to work in. Um, next year, I'll mark my 30 years in WHO. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions in the discussion, we can set aside time to talk about that. Before I get going, can each of you take uh, 30 seconds to think about one group in your country which may be uh, left out from um, progress in adolescent sexual and reproductive health and um, why that might be so. And I'm, I've opened the chat and I'm happy to take three suggestions from anyone. My question to you is uh, from your knowledge of your country or community, which groups are likely to be left behind, are being left behind and why? So really, a couple of minutes. I'd like all of you to do this, but if whoever is ready can put your idea in the chat. Pallavi, um, LG, LGBTQI, um, in the UK, but that's probably true in many places as well. Thank you, Pallavi. Uh, Gufran, women and girls in Sudan. Uh, Katya, Romanian adolescents. Uh, ben, indigenous and aboriginal adolescents in Western Sydney and perhaps in Australia in general. Catholic school students. Um, in some contexts, you're talking about Scotland. Great, I'm going to talk about Scotland later on in my presentation. So you get these messages. <laughs> I'd love to keep a lively chat going and you know, add to comments that I make. And, uh, and then um, my aim is to complete this presentation, um, giving us 15 minutes to talk, but also you know, to feel free to communicate with us afterwards. I'm going to go fast so that we have, in fact, time to talk. I'm going to make five points. The first point is that over the last 25 years, much more progress has been made on adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights than in other areas of adolescent health, such as mental health, such as nutrition, such as substance use. And this is very likely because of the attention to an investment in this area over the last 25 years. 
since the International Conference on Population and Development in 1994, but even before that, you know, with HIV drawing attention to the to uh, uh, prevention uh, in young people. This is an extract from a Lancet paper published um, uh, in 2019. I'm not going to read out the text, but in the first paragraph, you see the progress in a number of ASRHR indicators. And in the second paragraph, you see the lack of progress in a number of non-ASRHR indicators. And this is true even for high-income countries. So what are the implications of this? The implications are that we need to consolidate the gains in adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights and to build on them. And to address other health issues in a progressive and strategic manner. Many countries cannot take on all these issues at the same time, but strategic choices need to be made on which ones to address and why. Elsie and I co-authored this paper. And again, if you're interested in these papers, we can make them available. Anything to add to this, Elsie? Any 30-second input? No, not for this slide. OK. The second point is within adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights, substantial progress has been made in the areas um, uh, listed in green. Um, uh, lack of trends in the areas listed in yellow or in uh, amber and, and uh, clear indications that levels have either increased um, or st stagnated in the areas shown in red. So this is again from a paper that we published in 2019, taking stock of progress in the 25 years since the International Conference on Population and Development. Girls today are much more like, girls and boys are much more likely to initiate sex later and to use condoms when they do so. Girls are less likely to be married, to have children before 18, more likely to use contraception, more likely to use maternal health services, less likely to be, to support FGM, female genital mutilation, and so on. No clear trends in unsafe abortion, but we believe that there has been progress, particularly because medical abortion is now increasingly available in many places. And girls don't need to depend on gatekeepers who are reluctant to provide them with abortion services. STIs all over the world have been neglected and STI rates, um, sexually transmitted infections are on the rise all over the world. Um, sadly, they have been neglected. Intimate partner violence, you've all learned what has happened during the context of lockdowns uh, over the last two years. And you know, over uh, even before this was a problem, this is actually worsened. What do we need to do? Very similar to what we said in relation to the first slide, consolidate the gains made, extend the work to other areas. And a clear priority is violence, intimate partner violence. Elsie, later on, if you want to speak to what's happening in Kenya, you can do that, or you can do that now. Anytime you want to jump in, Elsie. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Elsie. This is your slide, your set of slides. Okay, um, we've seen that even in areas of adolescent sexual reproductive health, in which they have there has been progress, this has been uneven. A good example, as you can see here, is child marriage we see across these five countries which are make the top 10 countries according to unicef estimates of um, countries with the highest levels of child marriage some years ago it was estimated that one in four girls worldwide are married before age 18 years this estimate today is one in five but as highlighted before as they stated earlier the levels of decline have been uneven between regions and between countries Next slide, please. This slide shows um, variation within countries in Bangladesh and Guinea. In the previous slide, we saw at the national level, Bangladesh had about 51% um, of child marriage. And in this slide, we see that there's variation within the country ranging from about 50% 
in Silite to 79.8% in Rajshahi. Similarly, in Guinea, the national proportion for child marriage was about 47%. And here we see variation with the central region having the highest level of child marriage, ranging from about 21% in Conakry to 61.8% in Faranay. Next slide, please. So this um, slide shows that there are also disparities at the socioeconomic, by social economic attributes, and it shows the adolescent first parts. In the five countries presented in this slide, in the Latin America and Caribbean region, there has been little progress in reducing first parts, especially in, in the youngest age group amongst the poor and those who live in rural areas. Next slide, please. So given um, the presentation on um, adolescent first parts, what are the implications for this? Firstly, broad and multi-sectoral multi -sectoral approach needs to be um, the primary focus at the proximal and distal levels. A holistic approach to expand sexuality education and introduction and enforcement of legislation to provide effective protection from abuse or exploitation. Essentially, the central message from this slide is that unless we address both the proximal and distal determinants of adolescent fertility, there will be little progress. Over to you, Chandra. And unless they are targeted. Elsie, a word about violence in Kenya. Do you want to talk about that? So violence in Kenya before COVID was not, was generally underreported, but we've seen a, a surge in violence, especially when it comes to intimate partner violence, spousal abuse. We see everyday reports of, um, of women being attacked to the point of being murdered. And this we see it every day being reported in news and some of them go un underreported. But it, COVID-19 has really highlighted the, the has really highlighted the problem of violence against women and how the legislation and the police force are not really engaged to, to help curb this problem. Over to you, Chandra. Thank you. Why don't we take a 30 second, one minute pause. Any comments, any experience, any knowledge about intimate partner violence in your countries? Can you put it in the chat, please? There's a question to you, Elsie, from Sam. How much do you think that rising levels of intimate partner violence are due to increased reporting? Any comments in the chat on, on what you're reading in your countries, what you know about intimate partner violence in your countries? Thanks for your comment, Ben, about being exacerbated because of restrictions. While we wait for the rest to respond, um, yeah. Sam, I do agree that rising intimate partner violence to some extent could be due to an increase, increased reporting. And then also as Ben highlighted, it's exacerbated by the COVID-19 restrictions. Lockdown in the UK worsen risk of domestic violence and likely non-accidental injuries in children in the UK. <laughs> Um, there, were a there are a number of comments about the UK, but this is true all over the world. So I, I certainly believe that there is um, uh, better reporting. Women and girls and boys too, you know, uh, feel that they can speak about, speak up. Uh, and there's, in fact, efforts to encourage them to speak up. But I think that there's, uh, uh, there's clear evidence that, you know, um, uh, um, that there has been I mean, you, you see that from data, from centers, hotline centers, from centers for which provide care. Elsie uh, and I will speak to something else. Over the last two years, we've had a number of reporters come in to say, you know, can you, there's been an upsurge of teenage pregnancy in Kenya or Zimbabwe or here or there. Um, and everyone wants to write about all this upsurge, you know. And, and you know, there is very little evidence of that. Um, uh, and we, let's talk a little bit about that, you know, um, how easy it is to stereotype countries and talk about 
you know, girls are not going to school. So all they're doing is screwing around and getting pregnant. And there's a huge upsurge. That's the narrative. You know, how do you deal with this? What do you, what can you, what, uh, how have we dealt with it? Elsie and I, you know, Elsie is a young woman from young professional from Kenya. So she, she has faced many of these questions. Let me move on. Thank you for the comments on Moldova, um, on um, a number, number of uh, your, um, uh, inputs from um, the UK. Um, let's, let's come to your point, Ben, about how accurate are epidemiologic data. Um, uh, and we'll come to that in the end. Um, OK. Let's move on to the fourth point, four out of five points. COVID-19 is having a devastating impact on the lives of adolescents in many areas. We are about to publish a synthesis of findings from many countries of the world. And in blue on this slide, you see um, the effects that it has had. You know, education, health services, um, food insecurity, domestic care obligations, especially for girls. Um, <coughs> adolescents have many needs, and among them are needs related to sexual and reproductive health. Pallavi put down a point about LGBTQI. Last year, when I was speaking to a group of students from the Netherlands, one of them said, you know, um, some of us are LGBTQI. Our parents know that. We are stuck at home with them. It's real torture. So, you know, you, you, have, you have real issues here. We supported um, with a group um, uh, called GAGE, uh, Gender and Adolescence Global Evidence with, um, um, and Studies in Palestine. And, sh and, and you know, found that, uh, that, in, in, um, um, that these groups were, that in, in Gaza, the groups in the camps were much more affected than groups outside. So even in, you know, in, in areas like Palestine, where there are huge problems you know, at, at every level, there are some groups who are more affected than others. And so what are the implications of this? The implications are, of course, um, when we address um, building back better, uh, we have to pay particular attention to those who have been affected more. Let's take India, for example. You know, the, there was a devastating, you know, a ferocious second wave last year. An estimated 4 million people uh, have died as a result of that. You know, eight times government statistics. Um, uh, and, and, you know, in the lockdowns, in the, you know, harsh lockdowns, in the strict lockdowns, um, middle-class families got away fairly well it's the, it's the poorest of the poor. You know, if you're going to have remote teaching and you have one remote device shared by five people in the house with, uh, you know, weak uh, internet access, then, you know, remote learning and teaching is really only on paper. Um, this is data from a Pulse survey that WHO carried out several times during the um, pandemic, during the two years. Uh, and it shows that, you know, the number of countries which were affected. More, as you can see, nearly 44% of countries um, had, I mean, were, were affected, some more than others. And family planning and contraception was an area that was most affected. Um, facility births are less, you know. You can see that, you know, when uh, even in a crisis, even in a war situation, um, you know, somehow births occur and, up, you know, warring parties are able to allow this, even when they block everything else. Um, the fifth and last point, which then takes me to my examples, is that we need um, uh, to go beyond one size fits all. We need to develop policies and strategies that are uh, designed and executed to reach those who are being left behind. Now, I've given you an example of child marriage, for example, you know, and early childbearing. You know, if in, in, in rural India or rural Bangladesh, um, or even rural Scotland till fairly recently, 
um, if uh, childbearing is socially accepted and encouraged uh, and is really the only real option that um, a girl, a young woman has, providing contraceptive information and services is not enough. We need to do much more than that. Con having a baby at that age is, is either a choice, a conscious choice, or like many women say, you know, my mother had a baby when she was 16, my grandmother did. And, you know, that's what I will do as well. So, you know, it kind of goes. So, uh, so we need to find different ways to reach this group. And we also need to make sure that our interventions are reaching the groups we want them to reach. This is a, a evaluation of a study in Jharkhand state of India, which showed that, you know, a, a, you know huge, early, um, reasonably effective outreach intervention mainly reached older, unmarried, and literate adolescent girls and very few boys. So, you know, just because you have a drop-in center or an outreach program, it doesn't mean we reach the ones who absolutely desperately need to be reached. Okay, so what are the actions? The actions are adolescents are a diverse group, and that's true for adults as well. And, you know, they include a whole range of groups, you know, those in union, those outside union, those who are parents, those who aren't, those who are living with HIV, those who are not, those who are, who are living with a disability, those who are not, those are living with one parent or no parent, and those are living with two parents. So, you know, huge um, um, uh, differences and related to that huge needs. This is a useful tool for you to uh, uh, download. It's called Innovate, and it's a um, uh, step-by-step approach to not leaving anyone behind. And I, uh, I've included um, the title of a paper uh, on how they've applied this tool in Indonesia. So I think it's a useful framework to think through. I mean, you'll all have access to the slide set, uh, and you're welcome to use it in any way you want. OK, I'm going to um, conclude with three examples uh, of countries which have tried to or have uh, succeeded in or are beginning to move towards addressing those who've been left behind. Let's take the example of Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone had a brutal civil war. Uh, and then just as the country was getting to its feet, um, it had a devastating Ebola epidemic. But the then president of the country, uh, Koroma, decided to address adolescents as a priority group, developed a first national strategy for the reduction of teenage pregnancy. And in a desperately poor country, with the, with the work of partners and with a lot of support from the British government, um, among others, um, modern contraceptive use increased from 13% among married uh, to 13% from 1.2. And you can see the increase in unmarried adolescents and the decline in the adolescent birth rate. But the country realized that um, young first-time parents were a real um, vulnerable group. And so we supported them to develop a, a strategy for addressing pregnant adolescents and first-time mothers. <coughs> You're going to see the parallel to this in, uh, in Scotland in a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, Yufran, can you read the text on that slide, please? Aloud? Yep. Becoming a parent for the first time entails major life transitions. This is particularly true for pregnant adolescents and first-time adolescent mothers who may, be a who may be navigating a series of major life milestones, sexual debut, first pregnancy, marriage and union, first birth, in rapid succession with varied support from family, community, and systems or services. At the same time that many FTAMs are removed from family, school, and social support networks, they must also navigate caring for their own health while learning to care for a newborn. Thank you. So this is what the strategy contains. Uh, Katie, could you just uh, take us through the titles of these, the 10 titles of this um, national strategy? Sorry, I can't really see 
uh, the titles from my screen. You can't see it's the text. Anyone else wants okay. to brave it? You know, I have 63 year old eyes. You all have better eyes than me. Anyone else? Gideon? I can give it a go. Are you, are you, are you looking for us to read number one to ten? Yeah. Yes, just the, the titles of the chapters. The situation for adolescent mothers, meeting the unique needs of first time adolescent mothers. Uh, establishing quality responsive health service for the first time in adolescent mothers. Number four is preventing unintended and rapid repeat adolescent pregnancy, care during pregnancy. Um, it's, it's quite small, sorry. Uh, care at the time of birth and in the immediate postpartum period, post abortion care, the first weeks and months as a first time adolescent mother. And then uh, number nine is appendices and additional resources. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry, Katie. And thank you, Jennifer. So the point here is that, you know, although this is about, uh, it started with a discussion on preventing rapid repeat pregnancy. What this uh, document has done is it addresses the whole sexual and reproductive health needs of uh, a woman in this vulnerable situation and includes a whole on a section on positive fatherhood and engaging uh, young fathers, addressing mental health, addressing the young baby. Uh, I, I, I invite any reactions to this in, chat, in the chat. Any quick reactions? Any, any, any reactions that you heard, that you, that, you, uh, that you kind of thought through when you heard the Sierra Leone example? It's really comprehensive, you know, for a country that's um, working on something that's really difficult to navigate. It's really comprehensive. Thank you, Gufran. And any other comments? One of the beautiful things about this strategy is that it's not a vertical program. So there is no, um, you know, vertical program for, um, for first time mothers and no special clinic for first time mothers. What they have done is try to integrate this into the existing programs in the country. Any other reactions? It's great to see that uh, positive fatherhood has been- uh, If somebody is speaking, you need to speak up. I can't hear you. Sorry, uh, I was just saying, it's, it's good to see that positive fatherhood has been included in the strategy. Yes, absolutely. I love that. You know, I think it's, it's so very important and, and you know, it's, um, uh, so very important to do that and give young fathers a place and give them the support we need to do. We often criticize young men for not doing what we expect them to do, but then don't tell them or support them to do. Any other comments before I move on to Jamaica? I think it's really nice to see um, that there's a section on post oh, What's your name, please? Uh, Katya. Yes, go ahead, Katya. Yeah, I think it's really nice to see that there's a section on post-abortion care as well. And I'm just wondering if that includes mental health care as well, because even though um, a young girl might go through the decision of that she doesn't want to have a baby, it might still have, you know, psychological ramifications, the aftermath. So it's nice to see that they are uh, thinking about that. Thank you. There is a section on mental health support 8.4. But really speaking, you know, mental health is, uh, has to be addressed in every aspect of our work, you know, every aspect of our work, you know, in, in, in terms of let's take contraception. Uh, and I'll take you to the next slide. You know, um, in many places, girls are, are, are extremely scared about using contraceptives because they, we use terms like long acting methods. Long acting methods is a frightening term for a young woman whose entire future and whose value in society depends on being a mother. And so the fear of contraception. Uh, so, you know, whether it's contraception or maternal health or abortion, you're right. You know, you have to address the mental health uh, components. Okay, we are about to publish a paper on Jamaica and I'm really, uh, I love this initiative. It's a 40 year initiative. Started as a pilot is a nationwide program now. So the problems are listed in red uh, on the left side of the screen, and I'm not going to read them out. 
It's a problem that many countries face, and I'd love to have a short discussion on this, on um, what do you do with, um, what is your experience with, um, with you know, girls getting pregnant, and then what happens to them in your country? Uh, so what they did in Jamaica was this NGO started, non-government organization started a program, and the interventions are listed uh, on the bottom of the slide, and the groups targeted are listed on the slide. They use a term called baby fathers. It's a cute term. We thought it was a typo begin to start with, but that's a term for, you know, fathers of young babies. So continued and supplemental education, counseling, school placement, childcare and parenting skills building, and family planning, counseling, and services. So what they did was they brought these girls into a place, gave them um, um, some, you know, education um, uh, in this center and then helped them find a place to go back to school uh, and then supported them to be young parents and uh, to prevent repeat pregnancies. And while you look at this slide, I'd love to have some comments in the chat. What happens in your country uh, on, um, uh, on um, um, to, to young, uh, to adolescent mothers. If a girl gets pregnant in school. Gideon, Celeste, Greg, any thoughts, any reactions, any comments in the chat? What happens in Scotland? What happens in, in India? What happens in England? when a girl gets pregnant in school. Hello. You know, can you put your comments in the chat and we can all see. Somebody wanted to speak up, you're welcome. Even if support exists, most do not continue schooling. Erin, where are you from? Where are you talking about? Um, so my background is mainly in Scotland and England. Okay, so I think often cool. there are support available for young mothers, but due to other reasons such as kind of stigma or kind of beliefs around young pregnancy, they don't continue schooling or it's deprioritized. That's right. That's right. And I'm going to go to Scotland in a minute now. Any other comments? from any other context? It depends on political will in the country. You're absolutely right, uh, Dennis. And it's wonderful to have your new president um, come up with progressive policies about COVID and about everything else. It's so important. Tanzania is such a you know, great country. So much has been done, a country which has been at peace and you get one president who is an absolute nutcase and then, you know, uh, wants to put pregnant girls in school and for 20 years. Um, and, and those who made, uh, and, and, and it's really, really a, an issue of leadership, um, as you will see in a minute. Some schools are specialist unit for pregnant girls to support their learning. Only few have them. Um, any other comments? Um, in the areas in the, I work in, in the UK, many leave school. That's true. No education provision for teenage mothers. In Nigeria is stigmatized by virtually everyone, most likely to drop out of school. Any, any, anyone burn, uh, burning with a burning comment to share with us? You want to speak up? Nam is talking about the US and most girls are ridiculed. And I think that's true everywhere. Um, and I think, you know, the, that's why this Jamaica example is so powerful. Look at what, what has happened to the girl who wrote this note, you know, life transformed um, by somebody who, when she stumbled, um, there was someone to help her get up and move ahead with her life. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Scotland. Uh, we had, had a lot of comments about Scotland, and I don't know whether you know about the strategy. You probably do, and so I'm going to speak to this, and then we can 
um, we can we can talk depending on how much time we have. So Scotland developed a strategy on pregnancy and parenthood. And um, as you can see on this slide, and I won't reach read it out, one of the key areas of focus was inequity. Huge levels of inequity in Scotland in terms of um, who gets pregnant and then who continues with the pregnancy. So access to um, abortion services, safe abortion care, but also you know, access to contraceptive information, contraceptive services, and of course, desire to avoid a pregnancy. They put in place a strategy, and now there's a new, um, there's a second phase of the strategy, a second progress report um, with four strands, leadership and accountability, giving young people more control, pregnancy in young people, parenthood in young people. So leadership and accountability, they've been working with local government areas to raise awareness, to understand local needs, and to share good practices. This is a huge area for me. I strongly believe in this issue of collaborative learning, learning from others around you to see how they are doing, uh, rather than from an expert who comes from afar. Uh, secondly, is giving more uh, young people more control you know, um, uh, Scotland has a um, sexuality education program. So this here is focus on <coughs> primary age children and those with learning difficulties. Uh, then dealing with, um, uh, with pregnancy in young people, maternal health services, and then parenthood in young people and helping them get back to school. And as you can see in this slide, um, the rates of pregnancy have declined, and they've declined most in the most deprived areas. Though, as several of you have commented, much more needs to be done. For me, Scotland is a very good example of a country which understood inequity was fundamental to its uh, problem and tried to address it and is addressing it. Um, my last slide. Over the last 25 years, much more progress has been made in adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights. Then in other areas of adolescent health, such as mental health and, and, and nutrition. Within ASRH, there's been substantial progress in some areas and limited or no progress in others, such as STIs. Thirdly, even in areas of ASRH, as Elsie showed you, progress has been uneven. COVID has had a devastating impact on the lives of adolescents in many areas. And the most vulnerable ones are predictably the worst affected. We need policies and strategies to reach those who are being left behind. And we need to do that not in the context of small boutique projects, but in large scale programs like the ones I've shown you. I'm going to stop here and um, invite comments and questions. It is 23. So we have a good uh, 20 minutes for discussion. Um, there are a couple of questions which I can try to address. One is a question uh, from Gideon about, is there a plan to develop a tool to help support groups and organizations engaged in preventive actions and advocacy against child marriage? So the answer to that question is yes. Elsie, do you have uh, your good news slide on child marriage? Is that done? Is it ready to share? Yes, I can share it. As a working draft, you can just share it as a working draft. Let's see if you need permission. Yeah, you can share. So while you're doing that, um, um, the, the, the message is uh, to, to you, Gideon, is yes. Um, um, there's a UN program on child marriage. Uh, and there's a there's a huge amount of work that it has been doing with enormous amounts of resources. Here is a report that they published. Check it out. If you're interested in any further information, I'm happy to share it with you. Another group that I think you should check out is a group called Girls Not Brides. It's based in London. Uh, you know, when I studied at the London School many years ago, 
London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I used that uh, the time of being in London to go and visit organizations, go and visit Girls Not Brides. You know, they're doing some really uh, fascinating work on uh, working with civil society groups around the world to address child marriage. Over to you, Elsie. Over to you, Elsie. Do you want to share your slides? Elsie, are you there? Have you dropped off? So I don't see Elsie. Probably she dropped off. Maybe she'll come back. Any questions? So I see your comments. I'm happy to respond to them. Um, how do you approach addressing the different needs of adolescents and communities where the topic of SRHR may be taboo? This is uh, Gufran. Um, now, um, this is a very interesting question. Let's talk about this. Um, for me, uh, you know, I come from India. I uh, come from a South Indian family, a highly educated family. You know, now I talk about oral sex, I talk about fist fucking, I talk about um, all these very easily. But, you know, I come from a family where I did, there was no sexuality education in, in the school that I went in to. You know, uh, um, the teacher said, like many teachers around the world, you know, there'll be no questions on this chapter. You can read about this at home. Um, there was no discussion on sexuality at home. Um, so you come to terms with it yourself. You start working on it. Um, and so what do you do? Uh, I, I think you can start working in areas which are not controversial. And, and um, one area where, which is not controversial in any country is working with young married couples. You can start uh, and preventing rapid repeat pregnancy. We are working in Afghanistan on this. We are working in Pakistan. Um, so we are doing a lot of work in countries which have learned to, um, um, to identify areas which are non-controversial and start working on them. So if you start in you know, Somalia or South Sudan or Sudan, and you say, my first area of work is going to be, you know, I need to go to schools and talk to schools about preventing unwanted pregnancies and access to contraception and safe abortion care doors close. You can actually start work with non-controversial areas, build support and move from there. And there are many examples. Elsie, are you back? I think Elsie has dropped out, but I'm going to try to um, share with you. Yes, Chandra, and, and... I'm back. Apologies. Go ahead, Elsie. Go ahead. Can you share your screen and share the example that you wanted to? Yes, sure. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, so this is an example that's highlighting the progress in child marriage over the past two decades or so, which shows that there's been accelerated progress in certain high prevalence regions, especially in South Asia. And Bangladesh has been highlighted as one of the good examples showing the steepest decline of child marriage. child marriage worldwide. And um, it has also shown declines in child marriage across richer and poor segments of the society, as well as massive strides in declines in extreme poverty, a rise in G GDP per capita, and improvements to girls' education. So this is one of the graphs that was highlighted in the presentation that Chandra and I just did. And it shows about 22% decline percentage points decline between 1994 and 2019. And this slide shows the decrease over the years between 1994 and 2019 between um, across wealth quintile and education. And we'll see that this decline has been progressively, um, the, the variation has been declining between amongst wealth quintile, between the poorest and the richest. And we also see the decline happening amongst those with um, 
varying degrees of education across um, between 1994 and 2019. Thank That's you. Now, um, this was an, uh, an example of work done with, um, um, you know, in the context of the Millennium Development Goals, child marriage was not on the agenda. What we now have is, a, is a child marriage is hugely on the agenda in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. And we, in a growing number of countries, we are seeing progress. Elsie, can you go back to your first slide, please? Sure. And please download this report and you will find wonderful examples and you will find contact addresses. Um, I'm going to share, I have a question from Ben uh, on the completeness of data. Can you speak to that, Elsie? And before you do that, I'm going to share one more slide set. Um, so Ben has asked you to comment on completeness of data. Um, so there's a question about... Um, Comprehensive, uh, um, I think a question about, um, you know, what do you do in conservative contexts? And I'm sharing with you experiences from India, Jharkhand state, Pakistan. Um, and the message here is what they did in Pakistan was, and so one example from Pakistan I'll speak to, and then um, I, I don't know, you can check this out. This is, um, a website called Love Matters. Now, Love Matters as an Indian version, Love Matters as an, um, um, as an Arab version, a Francophone version. And, you know, it's wonderful. I, I pass it on to my nieces and nephews and everyone else, you know. <clears throat> and it, what it does is it um, takes away <clears throat> the discussion on sexuality and reproduction uh, from a biomedical discussion to, um, to, you know, real life, you know. You're sitting in a cinema theater with a friend. He puts your hand, his hand on your hand and you don't really see this boy as a friend. What do you do in this context? <clears throat> and so that's how discussions on consent and, you know, my body, my life kinds of discussions take place. So my answer to your question uh, of addressing um, uh, to you, Gufran, is um, you can work like they have done in Pakistan to build support on issues that the community wants their girls to be educated and boys to be educated about, on menstrual health, on child marriage, on intimate partner violence. And so they have worked with community support and navigated the obstacles that the mullahs have created for them uh, to do much more than many states of India, which is a liberal democracy have done. So I think it's, there is a way to do this, but of course it means careful strategy. <coughs> Elsie, Ben, completeness of data. Um, thank you for your question, Ben. So with regards to pregnancy and births, there are different sources where we can obtain this information. For example, at the national level, there is the multiple indicator cluster survey and the demographic and health surveys, which collect retrospective data. So they collect data on those who are currently pregnant or those who had been pregnant at a particular period of time. If you're collecting adolescent births and you ask 20, 24 year olds if they were pregnant, how old they were when they first gave birth. So um, there is there is a benefit advantage of using this because you're able to, to try to estimate the country's estimates. Um, a disadvantage on doing this, there the tends to be age heaping or lack of memory or remembering when they gave birth. We do acknowledge that the vital statistics can vary from country to country. And in some countries, there are no birth registration. But then also there, were, there are estimates from the United Nations population data which estimates, which do an estimation projection of data for births per 1,000 women of different age groups, starting from 15 years old up until 49, the age of reproductive. So based on these sources, we try to use both the national representative household surveys and the, the estimated projected esti estimates from the UN population division. Have you done NC? So, you know, Ben, just to add to this. That, that, yeah, um, I just, sorry, I was just going to say that's, that's a really clear answer, Elsie. Thank you very much. That's, that's really helpful. Great, yeah. 
You know, COVID has shown us that, you know, there's a huge problem with data. Countries such as the UK, such as Belgium, Switzerland, you know, they have up-to-date data, uh, which they can post every day. Um, in the beginning, we were saying there's no COVID in Africa. COVID is not affecting Africa. And then there were studies of post-mortem uh, studies in many hospitals uh, of Africa, which showed that, you know, a third of dead patients had um, COVID-related symptoms, which were never diagnosed. So, you know, there is a problem of access to care. There's a problem of statistics. Uh, and this is work in progress. I think data is much better than it was in the past, uh, but there's still enormous work to be done. Sam, you have a question of how do you quantify rates on um, uh, IPV um, globally? Um, so again, um, I'm going to ask LC to comment on that. But um, what we've been doing in WHO is, you know, maternal mortality estimates, maternal morbidity estimates, child marriage estimates. What we do is we define indicators. We work um, to communicate those indicators with a numerator, a denominator, a means of verification. Um, we um, uh, publish those statistics. Um, and, you know, we support countries, we work with countries to estimate statistics. There are often questions about where did you get this data from, how valid are they? So we work with them to support them and, and you know, educate them. And when they challenge us, we work with them to, um, to strengthen estimates. <clears throat> so that's how it is done. And of course, there's a huge level of underreporting. You know, I read a statistic uh, from England that is, you know, what's the proportion of women who experience household violence? That's a question. What's the proportion of them who report that they have experienced violence? What's the proportion of them who seek care? Now, all these areas are flawed. You know, where, uh, there are uh, the, uh, data is flawed, but there are efforts to try to improve this. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, on uh, on our paper on menstrual health. And I'm going to share um, this, um, another slide and take you through this. This has five slides. Um, okay, very quickly. So we published a paper last year uh, um, with, on a definition for menstrual health. And this is the paper. You can download that if you're interested. I'll give you my, um, my, um, my website. I have uh, all my publications posted there. My son, who's, um, who does digital marketing, uh, helped set up my website, and he kind of helps me update it and rolls his eyes every time I hit a roadblock. Uh, but menstrual health, a definition for policy, practice, and research. And here is our definition. And um, so this definition is not just an outcome, but also in terms of process. You know, achieving menstrual health implies that you can do these things. You can access information, you can access uh, services, you can access care. Uh, you can access, you are in a respectful environment where menstruation is normalized um, and is seen as a positive, um, uh, um, a positive phenomenon, and that you are allowed to participate. In many parts of the world, you're not allowed to participate. Uh, in, in my mother was not allowed to participate uh, to enter the kitchen when she had her periods. Um, uh, so you have access to materials, facilities. So you have um, this and th so this is my answer to your question on, you know, why did we decide to come up with this definition? Because the previous definition was about menstrual hygiene. Now hygiene um, means, you know, it talks about, you know, is the woman smelling okay? And, you know, has she soiled her clothes and, you know, um, so it's it's very much to do with you know cleanliness and 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 you know uh, you know is the woman clean and uh, 
health is much broader. It relates not just to the menstrual cycle. Uh, it, re uh, it relates to the entire cycle, not just to the period of menstruation. It talks about all the dimensions, including mental health. Um, and it, it talks about the actions needed so that it's not just about the person, but also about the environment and about all the sectors. And also <laughs> acknowledges that there are um, uh, transgender and non-binary people who have different needs. So that's why placing um, menstruation in the context of health is important. Although at the same time, you don't want to biomedicalize everything and make everything a problem. You know, uh, menstruation is a celebration. You know, I have a daughter and we, as you can imagine, I talked to my daughter as she was growing up, read a wonderful book, <clears throat> which I strongly recommend by Miriam Stopar, a British book, you know, questions that children ask, how to answer them. Um, and um, when she had her periods, she was very proud. She was very well informed. Of course, she has problems from time to time. But, you know, it's very much about normalizing this and seeing this as part of being a girl uh, or a woman. And just to conclude, you know, uh, our neglect of menstruation is part of a lifelong series of insults um, to girls and, and women. You know, girls are killed even uh, before they are born with feticide, which is practiced in so many parts of the world. The unequal... Uh, male-female ratio in India and China are, you know, testimony to this. They are killed mm -hmm. after they are born through willful neglect. In many uh, neonatal units, 80% of the babies are male uh, because the girls are not brought. You know, nice way to kill a girl is not treat her when she has pneumonia. So you're not killing her through an act of omission, but you're killing her through an act of commission and, and so on. So addressing menstrual health is important. That's why for the last 10 years, I worked on it because it gives you a handle to address many other issues about neglect of women and girls. Any final comments, any reactions? Have I done anything on SRHR and IDP camps? No, not myself, but we are now carrying out, uh, doing a course, a distance education course um, on adolescent sexual and reproductive health in the Eastern Mediterranean region. So I'm going to give you a link to the course. Uh, and um, there's a wonderful Egyptian woman called Shata El Nakib, who has been adding uh, information on um, ASRH in the Eastern Mediterranean region, that is in the Arab world and North Africa, in the context of COVID-19 and in the context of humanitarian situations. So two of the modules have been put up. One of CSC was the first one. The second one is contraception. Have a look at what they have done in the context of um, humanitarian crises. And Chandra, um, just to add on top of... Um... Um, what you just said, although it's not really directly related to IDP, we did, um, we were part of a group, a team that were developing an ASRH toolkit in humanitarian settings, which includes um, the priority ASRH in emergency activities, meaningful participation with adolescents and key stakeholders, and going beyond health services, as well as the relevant ASRH services and interventions and the data that's needed to take action. I can share the link here with you. And if you can just have a look, that's one of the toolkits that we work to save the children. Thank you, Elsie. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to do an exercise. And this, is, this will take you one minute. Um, don't send the, uh, the, the WhatsApp, uh, the, the chat message, only send it when I tell you to. So all of you, including Elsie and me, you're going to write one phrase on your takeaway message from this session. One phrase on your takeaway message from this session. And as you do that, um, uh, I'm going to talk to you about working for WHO. So uh, you do that, and then I'll tell you when to send it. Um, do, Gideon, 
uh, you're wasting your time. I asked you to write a takeaway message, not to thank me. Uh, so do your takeaway message and don't send it till I tell you to send it. One message you take away from this session. I'm going to give you a count of five. And at the count of five, I want you all to send that message. One, two, three, four, five. Send your messages out, please. Isn't this fun? I hope you'll use this in, um, in, your, in your work. This is how you can... Uh, you can see just just reading this. You know, Jamaica nailed it. Scotland is a great example. Menstrual health and mental health, the importance of fathers' roles in young child marriage and in everything else. Reproductive health includes both mental and physical health. Promising but uneven progress. I love your comments. Thank you all. A warm hug to all of you. You know, I'm 63 years old and this year I'll turn 64 and next year I'm going to retire. And one of the things I'm going to do is spend uh, three months of the year in Kerala and, you know, walk for an hour and a half in the beach in the morning before a breakfast of fresh fruit, uh, which is my um, fantasy. Um, of course, I'll continue to work on adolescent health till I die. Um, but um, WHO is a great place to work in. WHO is a great place to work in because you're not working for any rich country. No one in these 30 years have told me not to say anything. You really can speak from the heart and speak with good science. And WHO is a great place to come and, and, and change the world. Uh, look at our director general. You know, his, his brother died of, um, uh, of a childhood illness. He promised himself that he would do something. Look at how he speaks in these pressers about the, the obscene inequity that rich countries who talk about equity, uh, who now practice it in the context of COVID, uh, and how uh, to assuage their guilt feelings, they kind of pass on vaccines to WHO three months before they are due to expire. You can say these things in WHO. And you can do these things in WHO, the kinds of things we've been doing. So do uh, think about working for the UN. It's a wonderful place to work for. And it's a place that we can work with other like-minded people to change the world. So lots of love to you. Over to you, Doreen. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chandra. Uh, and I, I, think, uh, you, I think you all can feel the passion uh, that Chandra has um, working in, in, in the areas that he does and that what makes him a very special person and a very special speaker. And uh, this afternoon, they're going to have a career session, or I think tomorrow they're gonna, there's going to be a career session uh, where Hans will actually really explain even more about uh, WHO. Um, but I agree with Chandra, it is, WHO is, a, is it's a really, there's challenges, it's not all perfect, but it absolutely makes it worth working with for this organization. So thank you, Chandra. Thank, thank you, Doreen, for, but before that, you have to thank Elsie. Uh, uh, Elsie uh, put together this presentation with me. It's, Great. Uh, thank you for thanking me, but you know, Please remember that all our work, every substantial piece of work that we do is with young people. We pay young people for the work they do with us. And we try very, very hard to include young people from the South in our work. People yeah. like Elsie. Yeah, that's, so, that's fantastic. Thank you Sorry. all. Enjoy the rest of your course. Thank you, Doreen, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye Elsie. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thanks so I think you, you I, I suggest you get yourself ready for a lunch break. I think the, the sessions we're going to have, I mean, it is totally informal um, breakout rooms and, you know, get a lunch, grab a tea, take whatever you need. And, you know, I think um, because it's in, I believe it's in, uh, it's, it's in 15 minutes, but, you know, take, take, take the meetings. If you want to eat during it, it's going to be a networking session. So you can do anything you like. Okay. Have a take a break and uh, we'll see you for all there for the networking sessions. <laughs>